Okay, guys, chapter one talks about what is victimology. So before we get into the study of victimology, let's talk a little bit about what it actually is. So victimology is defined in your text as the scientific study of the physical, emotional, and financial harm people endure because of illegal activities. So when someone has become the victim of a crime, what is the impact on them? Okay, and that can include, obviously, when we think about violent crime, physical impacts, um, when we think of all crime emotional, and certainly a piece that we don't think of very much, but there is often a financial harm that is um, that occurs to, to victims of crime. One of the other things that we want to think about is we're also talking about how the criminal justice system handles victims. And that has changed over time. Um, and we are handling victims a lot better today than we have in the past. So let's just start with defining what victims are, who victims are. So victims are people, individuals who suffer an injury, a loss, or a hardship for any reason. Now when we think about, so, so that would include someone who's a victim of a natural disaster or a victim of other things, okay? But we're really interested in crime victims. So those are people who've suffered an injury, a loss, or a hardship as a result of a crime, right? So as a result of some illegal activity that's been committed against them, um, we have direct and pri or direct or primary victims. Those are the people that experience the criminal act and its consequences firsthand. So if we were thinking about a murder case, uh, the direct or primary victim would be the person who was actually killed. But there are also indirect or secondary victims. That's the family and loved ones of those who might be burdened but are not the immediate person who has experienced the criminal activity. Uh, so that can include caregivers. It can include first responders as well. So when we think about victimology, we're thinking about all the people who've been impacted by a particular criminal activity. So when we think about victimization, one thing we want to do, as we do with criminology and everything else in criminal justice, is to look at it empirically, which means to look at it scientifically. Okay, we could take a subjective approach. That's where we're approaching something from the standpoint of morality or ethics um, it could be when we're responding emotionally or from a personal point of view. But when we want to study something subject scientifically, we want to study it objectively. We need to be fair, open-minded, even-handed, dispassionate, neutral, and unbiased. This can be a little bit more difficult to do when talking about victims. So one of the things we don't want to do and being objective is to really advocate for one side or another. So victimologists, people who are studying victimization, are not supposed to be, quote, pro-victim. Okay? So when we think about an ideal type of victim, right, and this is what the media often portrays to us, um, we're talking about a person who has suffered harm, who was weaker compared to the aggressor, they were acting virtuously. They weren't looking for trouble. They weren't breaking any laws. So they weren't involved in a gang. They weren't uh, someone who was beating their wife. And they're basically um, a complete, you know, the wrongdoer is a complete stranger who's acting illegally and is unprovoked. But we know from our study of crime that this is pretty rare, right? That most victims are not sort of these ideal, uh, ideal or completely, it's often referred to as a completely innocent victim. So sometimes we're looking at who's the victim and who's the offender, and this is not always clear cut. So considering the following two cases that you might be familiar with, the Menendez brothers have been back in the media. Um, one of them, I can't remember if it's Eric or Lyle, has um, sort of a docu-series going on on TV right now where he's talking about the murders from his perspective. But these are two brothers who killed their parents, um, and uh, they... They later on went on to, during their trial, they went on to claim that they had been abused by their father. And it's often referred to as the abuse excuse. Um, if you look at the case of John and Lorena Bobbitt, if you're not familiar with either of these cases, I would encourage you to just sit down and Google them real quick so you kind of have an idea of what happened in each of them. Uh, this is a time where Wikipedia is sufficient. Uh, Lorena Bobbitt is pretty famous because she cut off her husband John's penis drove down the street, threw it into the woods. Um, it turned out that he had raped her a few days prior to that. Um, and so it's not always clear who the victim is. And sometimes someone is the victim, but they may have instigated whatever happened to them. So if you think about a case where a battered woman kills her husband, technically the husband is the victim, right? He's the victim of a murder. He's the victim of a homicide. Um, but we don't necessarily think of him that way. 
So we have to, when we look at this and we're studying this, we need to be objective. We have to think about the dynamics that happen between victims and offenders or victimizers, and we have to sort them out in an even-handed and open-minded manner. And when we're talking about one of these cases, we might be talking about, and in the John and Lorena Bobbitt cases, Lorena was tried for the assault on her husband and John was tried for the rape of his wife. So depending on which case we're looking at, the victim and the offender are different or they change. So remember, just because we've got this idea of this purely innocent victim, um, victims are not always quote unquote innocent. Now that doesn't mean, one thing we want to think about when we think about victimology is that we're looking at things that victims do, um, characteristics they have, things that might make them more likely to be victims. But we want to be very careful not to cross that into the line of victim blaming, where we're blaming the victim for what has happened to them. But victims are not always quote unquote innocent. Um, <clears throat> so think of a case maybe where a victim of repeated domestic abuse is found guilty of aggravated ass assault after firing warning shots. Think about the George, uh, George Zimmerman, Trevon Martin case. Uh, the designations victim and offender are not always opposite poles. Sometimes they're overlapping. So we also want to make sure that, you know, we're thinking about victims versus quote unquote good guys. So victimologists don't limit their studies to clashes between victims and offenders. They also want to think about how do we react to victimization as a society. Um, this is an interesting time and period in our culture to really think about this if you think about the Me Too movement and all the uh, media attention there's been around sexual harassment and sexual assault lately. So we also want to think about how we react to victimization. Uh, victims are often quote unquote used by other parties. Victims could be pitted against one another. The media might use them in order to portray crime a certain way. And so might political officials. Political officials might step in and try to use a social movement or victimization of some particular people um, in order to advocate for their policies. So one of the things we have to think about is being objective is a challenge. But whenever we're doing research or analyzing a policy and seeing if it works or evaluating a program to see if it works, we have to tell the whole truth, even if it means that something we thought would work doesn't work or if it means we're disappointed or insulted. So we want to pay attention to biases we might have and make sure that we're not letting those undermine our research. So there's three types of bias. One can come from your personal experience, okay? Now, a lot of times we study things that we're interested in because of our personal experiences. And even when people go to graduate school and in particular to um, PhD program, they often pick something that's of interest to them. That may come from personal experience. So you have to be careful not to let your personal experiences get in the way. Some of this comes from the legacy of the discipline itself. So pioneers in the study of victimology first introduced that concept of victim blaming. Um, and most victimologists today are pro-victim, even though when we study things, we want to study them objectively. We can't always, we don't want to go into it with sort of a pre-drawn conclusion. And then sometimes there's a bias that tra it traces back to what's going on at that time period. So in the 60s and 70s, we see a real demand for the government to really kind of get involved with victims, help them get back on their feet financially, medically, and emotionally. In the 80s, we see going on in our culture more self-reliance. So victimology has sort of gotten this bad reputation. It's a, newer, it's a newer discipline within the larger discipline of criminology and criminal justice, but it only means the objective study of crime victims. Okay, so it's focused on research about people harmed by criminals, and it should not be imposing a partisan viewpoint. It shouldn't be advocating for one particular viewpoint or another, what it's doing is looking at things objectively, and then it should be advocating for policies based on what does research tell us. Victimology during the 90s and in the 20th century has sort of become this dirty word, um, and people are confusing victimism with victimology. So just kind of step back a second. When we think about victimism, this is a coherent, integrated set of beliefs that shapes and leads our political action. So that is that personal kind of viewpoint. Okay, victimology is often misused when someone is actually trying to describe what's called victimism. So let's look at how that might get misused. A news magazine commentator complained, quote, we are deep into the era of the abuse excuse. 
The doctrine of victimology, claiming victim status means you are not responsible for your actions, is beginning to warp the legal system. This is a quote from 1994. And remember, I just said to you that the Menendez brothers, that's where we get this phrase, the abuse excuse, comes from their trial. So that's not what victimology actually is. And you guys, as um, people who've been studying criminal justice and have been working in the field, know that people misuse words all the time, okay? Uh, in particular within this field. So that's not what victimology is. Victimology is a scientific study of the impact of victimization. Um, so we have seen, if you, if, you know, if you want to look at box 1.2 in your book, it's giving us some highlights of the history of victimology and victim assistance. We've had a lot of gains in the U.S. Um, when the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice uh, really urged criminologists to pay more attention to victims. So it's one thing to look at offenders, but we also have to look at victims as well. We don't have a complete picture if we're only looking out, you know, one part of it. So victimology is really a sub-discipline within criminology. Criminology is really the scientific study of how laws are made, how laws are broken, and why they're broken, and how we respond to that. Criminologists ask why certain individuals become involved in law-breaking while others do not, whereas victimologists are asking why some individuals, households, or entities are targeted while others are not. So you can kind of really see a difference right there. Criminologists take their findings and then they're going to use that for crime prevention strategies, whereas victimologists are going to look at patterns and trends to think about how we can prevent victimizations and how we can reduce somebody's risk of victimization. So little things that you guys might do day to day um, to reduce your victimization, and there's probably little things you do you don't even think about it. So if you're someone who leaves on the porch light because you know you're going to come home when it's dark, or if you go out of town and you set your lights on timers, or you have a neighbor pick up the mail, those are all little things you do to um, make yourself safer. Both criminologists and victimologists study how the criminal justice system actually operates compared to how it's quote unquote supposed to operate. So boundaries are very clear cut for criminology while victimology is still a newer subdiscipline and it's not really as clear. And we see some overlap as a result of that. So we can look at different types of um, statistics. We can look at crime rates, how often certain crimes occur uh, and how often they occur based on population size. We can also look at victimization rates. Um, so for those of you who have taken, you know, intro to criminal justice, and I think this is talked a little bit in intro to criminology, you might remember learning about the National Crime Victimization Survey, which is looking at victimization rates, which are usually much higher than crime rates because crime rates are only crimes known to the police. Within this discipline, there's a more a conservative influence. This tends to focus, we tend to think more about street crimes. This is true um, within criminology as well. Um, <clears throat> The conservative influence talks about everyone being held strictly accountable for their decisions and actions. Uh, there's an emphasis on self-reliance, not help from the government, and also on personal responsibility for preventing and avoiding victimization. Um, and then what do we do? We punish offenders on behalf of victims. More liberal inference, influence within this field, uh, the scope of the field has extended beyond street crimes to include corporate corruption. How does that impact people? A lot of times that has... Um, a really far-reaching impact that we often don't think about because it doesn't necessarily have a violent physical impact. Um, this endorses more of a societal intervention, uh, talks about more, uh, more safety nets for people, and making wrongdoers repay their victims. The radical critical conflict influence says victimization is a result of an exploitative and oppressive social system and looks at societal factors. So how does poverty, unemployment, how do things like that um, help explain victimology or victimization. So what do victimologists do? They explore the interactions between victims and offenders, victims in the system, and victims in society. They study ways in which crime victims are harmed. So that, you know, includes sort of the most obvious thing when we think about a violent crime, what's that physical injury or physical trauma, any psychological trauma, and any financial loss. And a lot of times people forget that there is that there are financial costs associated with crimes. So when victimologists are carrying out research, they're going to stop and identify, define, and describe the problem. They want to measure the dimensions of the problem, right? So how big of a problem is it? What does the problem look like? 
investigate how victims are handled, and then gather evidence to test uh, any hypotheses they might come up with. So they're, as they're looking at this information, they might hypothesize that XYZ leads people to be more likely to become victims. Then what you would do is try to gather evidence to test that to see if you can find support for your theory. If you can find support for your theory, then you have scientifically backed up what, you, what you're arguing. Why study victimology? Well, first of all, we want to expand our horizons. And if we can understand how people, um, you know, become victims, that can also help us in addressing crime. Uh, we also want to think about practical applications there. The more we know about that, um, you know, the more, uh, you know, if we know that one little thing or one small thing you can do can make a difference in decreasing your victimization, uh, then that's, that's important information for you to have. One other thing we often hear about, too, is that uh, we often hear, depending on the arena we're talking about and the perspective you're coming from, we might often hear people refer to as survivors of crime. So this is particularly true with sexual assault. Uh, victims are often referred to as survivors, not in the criminal justice system, but they're referred to as such within, um, you know, the public health sphere or the sphere that's, uh, you know, advocates, the hospital when they're responding to victims. Okay, so this is really this idea that, or an observation that victimology's unavoid victimology has an unavoidable preoccupation with suffering, and we want to make sure that we balance that out by more a positive, upbeat line of inquiry. So we also want to think about the fact that people are resilient and they do recover. Um, for a lot of people, too, claiming to be a survivor of something as opposed to a victim is a little bit more empowering, and it helps with their recovery. And that wraps up this lecture.